Kia ora, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for attending today's ON Lunch and Learn webinar series. Um, welcome to another thought-provoking discussion on another topic that resonates with, with our community. This one is on New Zealand's food system. And today we have the privilege of hearing from two very distinguished experts who are deeply involved in shaping the future of New Zealand's food landscape. But before uh, I get started, I just wanted to say that today's webinar is recorded as you might have guessed. Uh, please keep yourselves on mute while we're going through the webinar. And I know you'll have some burning questions, so please pop those questions into the chat and our team will help us field questions and direct them to our speakers as we move through, um, through our topic. So this Lunch and Learn webinar will be available on the OAN's website on Monday, and we'll send a link out to everybody once it's up, so feel free to share it with others. And at the end of the webinar, if you haven't, uh, if you have some burning questions and you feel like we didn't get to them, please pop them into the chat before you leave. And uh, we'll turn this into a blog and we'll try to get out some answers for you as well. So today's conversation, uh, we're going to dive into the heart of New Zealand's food system. We're going to examine the challenges that we face, the vast opportunities for improvement for our food system, the potential risks that we face if we neglect some of these, um, that, you know, addressing some of these issues. But most importantly, we're going to talk about what we can do to make our food system better. And I'm very, very excited about our two guests because they are truly experts in, in their field. And they're going to help us really gain a better understanding of the issues that surround Aotearoa New Zealand's food system. And they're going to help us explore how we can pave the way for a brighter and more resilient future. Um, Emily King and Angela Clifford are personally two, two of my heroes. I see them at events. They're well, uh, well regarded in this space and I'm so excited for them to be here today. So thank you so much. So let me uh, first introduce uh, Emily King, who's a food system visionary from Spira. That's Emily's business that helps uh, companies and nonprofits and other entities really sow the seeds for change. She has extensive experience over a decade been, that she's been working um, in this field, in this space. And she has a, a strong passion for sustainable practices um, that are pretty instrumental in advancing the idea of a more responsible and eco-conscious food system. Emily's written a book uh, that was recently published. It's called ReFood. I cannot recommend this book enough. All of you need to go to her websites and uh, buy this book today. It's got tons of great data in it, and I learned a lot. And the book really explains the challenges we're facing in Aotearoa with our soil, our you know, fresh water, uh, food waste, climate change, packaging, uh, our lacking, our lack of you know, access to food across the country and unhealthy diets and the impact this is having on us. And um, and then not only educating us about these challenges, but also then helping us change our mindset to be able to tackle them. So really great information. So welcome, Emily. I also uh, joining us today is Angela Clifford from Eat New Zealand. She, uh, gosh, Eat New Zealand is one of my favorite organizations. Uh, Angela has the food farm, which is, uh, she has an organic permaculture down in Northern Canterbury. I am a huge follower on her Instagram, learning all the ways of food production. She's uh, hugely inspirational. Uh, Eat New Zealand, I don't know if, if you don't know the organization, please check them out. Um, they have a really great advocacy uh, program and to preserve and promote New Zealand's rich culinary history. Um, the, the team at Eat New Zealand are on the forefront of building a stronger, more resilient food community. I would say in increasing unique culinary credentials across each of the different um, areas of New Zealand. 
and um, and really looking at how we can make New Zealand a premium food destination in the world. So I'm really excited to learn about Eat New Zealand's latest endeavors and uh, welcome Angela. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, let's um, start an insightful journey into uh, Aotearoa New Zealand's food system. And we'll do this by, uh, I'll start asking a question by em to Emily, and then we'll switch over to Angela and we'll keep going back and forth until we, you know, solve the world problems. Just kidding. <laughs> so um, Emily, let's start with you. Can you please help us set the stage and kind of get a global perspective of the food system. Can you describe the food system from, from the, a big picture perspective and, and then touch on things that are, you know, how the food system is impacting our planet. Help, help give us uh, some overview of that. Nā koe tif, um, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Emily King taku ingoa, e te puaki, e o raro e o taranaki, ko Waiheke, toku kainga a nai nei. It's my absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, kia ora to people I know in the audience and kia ora to those I haven't yet met. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, yes, it's my absolute pleasure to talk to you about the food system globally and of course nationally. Um, I think I'll start with the global because it's all connected and important. Um, but first I will share with you an image to help for those of you in particular like myself who are visual um some of you those who have read my book would have seen this those who have been trained or at a talk with me before would have um, seen a version of the food system wheel but it's really important that we start here if we're going to speak about the food system um, at the core we're talking about systems thinking and that's quite big and overwhelming for people who um who are not naturally systems thinkers. Um, so in order to get our heads around the enormity of our, our dear food system, um, here's a, a, a vision that visual that can help um, with that. So I always start with the environment and begin with that because without soil, water and sunlight, we wouldn't have food. Then production, which is our farmers and growers, um, and thank you to farmers and growers that are in our audience today, working hard to grow food for us. Um, please mute all the people in the talk. It's a little distracting. Um, then our manufacturers are our processors and those who are making our food, um, right through to our retail and food service sectors. Of course, along the way, we have transport and logistics, including trucking and um, freight, air and shipping um, globally. And throughout the system, we also have waste. Finally, of course, it ends up that we eat the food. Um, so that's access to food and eating or not in the case of those who do not have access to food. So when we're talking about the food system, I ask you to zoom yourself out of what you might um, be used to thinking about. So today you've probably dropped the tools and you've come in from work or you've just put your headphones on because you're busy placing an order or whatnot in your food business. Um, this requires you to sort of take a step back from just your position have a little bit of a zoom out um, like you might on a an online map and have a look at our system from a slightly bigger perspective. What I've just described to you is the large scale industrial global food system. And because of the nature of that food system, it's relatively um, transportable <laughs> to almost all food systems in the world. Um, because of, well, the majority of them and the mainstream. Of course, here I'm not looking at indigenous food systems or historical ones. This is um, sort of the hump in the bell-shaped curve, so to speak, of that. So we can apply this, of course, to our national food system, our regional or local, but we can also apply it to our global because we're not disconnected from that. And in fact, many of the things that are influencing our food um, today are of course coming at us globally and are largely driven by um, businesses and private food uh, and large organizations that we will never really see or have anything to do with. I'm just gonna stop my screen share um, now and just keep talking. Um, hang on a second, thank you. So when when we're asking questions about the state of the global food system, um, I'll just make it a little contemporary <laughs> and zoom to the final quarter of 2023 um, and look at that state because 
Right now, there are three major external global factors that are affecting all of the food across the world. Um, one of the biggest ones is war. And so we're still seeing the impacts of the war of Russia on the Ukraine and the impact that that's having on the supply of um, wheat and grain globally and the pricing that that's causing. We're also seeing the flow and effects of climate climatic events, especially those that have just happened in the northern summer and the northern harvest um, and how that's affecting the world. And then we're also looking at a constant rise um, and the price of food, we know that as consumers in New Zealand, but I just want to reiterate to people that this is not a New Zealand only thing and nor will it only be solved by New Zealand. This is a global food system and this is a global effect. I also just want to point out that while I mentioned the war in Ukraine, I cannot really speak here today without mentioning the state of the people in Gaza right now who do not have access to food. And secondly, to those in Sudan who face one of the largest humanitarian crises that we've ever seen in the world. So. These are global, these are global issues, and they affect our global food system, they affect the price, and they affect us. So those are the big ones um, at the moment. But in terms of impact, our food system not only impacts on the environment through its impact on water, water usage, soils, um, and also on people, and of course climate change, it's also impacted by those things, in particular, as I mentioned just before, climate change. So while we um, have a food system that through its emissions of transportation and the growing of food and the making of it emit um, things to cause climate change, we also have a food system that is affected by the impacts of that change in our global um, temperature, which plays out in terms of things like flooding, extreme storm events, droughts, and other things, um, which are you know plaguing our um, growers and farmers like globally. So, um, these are, so these are some of the big crunchy issues, some of them you've probably thought about, but you may not have thought about them in terms of how it's all interconnected and how that plays out for us nationally. Um, so when we come into the national food system of New Zealand, uh, thank you, um, Tiffany, for mentioning my book. Yes, I've just written a book about the New Zealand food system and all of the details. So if you are interested in this, I highly recommend that you read it because I really talk about this um, in depth and that's what the entire book is about. So um, without, um, yeah, it's an enormous topic. So <laughs> read the book. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I can speak to it now too, briefly. So those impacts that I've described, of course, they affect us here. And so nationally, um, we, we have many of those challenges playing out, particularly around things like access to food and affordability of food. It's front of mind for many people, um, but as I often say, it's always in front of, front of mind for those that have not had access to food. Um, it's just front of mind for more people right now, and so we're listening more and thinking about it. Um, so often you might be thinking about food from just a growing or um, a getting food to the shops perspective if you're a farmer or a grower or food maker, or you might be thinking of it as a consumer in the store. Um, but actually what I really encourage people to do and what I do with all of my um, systems thinking and training and work that I do with clients is to really get you thinking about that full food system, which includes things like whether people can afford food, is the food healthy, um, also, is there food waste or are there other impacts on the environment to do with packaging um, or, yeah, many of the other impacts that we see in terms of playing out on land use like soil um, and other things. And what you might not have thought about are things like your role in this if you aren't direct, you might not think you're directly involved in the food system, but actually the food environments around us um, are quite frightening. And so how we design our urban spaces, how we plan for things in our city and municipal planning, and how we think about um, the design of lifestyles for people and things like marketing and advertising all play in to really impact our food system, um, especially when we're looking at the types of food that people buy. And I know for some of um, OAN's members, that will be really important because of course, a lot of you are advocating for healthier ways of growing food. And a lot of you are advocating for healthier food, food full stop for people from not only a planet, but also a health perspective. So these are the challenges that we face. And I believe that the food environment is the silent hand in the food system. And that's something that needs to be constantly talked about and reassessed because it's the thing that we don't 
don't always um, expect. So for now, I'm just going to pause because that was probably quite a long answer and start. Um, but yeah, happy to set the scene and really looking forward to hearing from you, Angela, as you answer some of these questions. Thank you, Emily. That was fantastic. A great and a great overview of the food system and the behemoth of of issues that face us from from adapting to climate change to addressing the effects of climate change, from wars, from food insecurity across you know the globe, uh, costs of transportation. Uh, and the flow on effects of all of those geopolitical situations all the way through to our local food scene. So it really has a massive impact. And thank you for sharing that visual because we can really utilize that from the big global perspective all the way down to the micro community um, level. So Angela, I wanted to ask you a question in terms of bringing it back to our, you know, to Aotearoa, New Zealand specifically, you know, what are some of the challenges that our food system is facing at the moment? Can you describe kind of the current state from your perspective? Kia ora koutou, ko Angela Clifford Toku Ingua, coming to you from Kowai in Waitaha, acknowledging that I'm on the land of the Naitahu people. Um, also wanted to acknowledge um, te waka kai ora um, as the Māori Organics um, Organisation, which I believe is in treaty partnership with um, uh, OANS, and um, acknowledge that they aren't part of this conversation today, but as an organisation, it's truly important that um, we understand that that's a really important relationship. Um, I also want to acknowledge the breadth of people in this conversation, looking at the list of who you are. You span um, the whole food system from farmers to manufacturers, government agencies, health professionals, um, uh, young people, future leaders. Um, it's just really, really broad. And um, I think that's important to acknowledge because if you feel that your concerns aren't reflected in this very short period of time we have, it's not because we don't think that this aspect of the food system is important. It's just that it's almost impossible to cover everything in this time frame. Having said that, I'll give it a red hot shot. Um, yeah, I think what I want to say first is that as far as I can see, I'm pretty confident that our current food system really isn't working for anyone. And when I say that, I mean that I spoke to a supermarket owner a couple of months ago who can no longer wear his um, branded jacket to pick up his children from school because of the reaction that the other parents have to the fact that he owns a supermarket or talking to people who work within supermarkets whose daily lives now are surrounded by um, disaffected people who feel like they don't have access to what's on the shelves. Um, we have just done a survey. There's a survey that's been done through Our Land and Water that looks um, at how farmers feel about their role in the food system. And it shows that the vast majority of farmers are actually genuinely concerned about um, New Zealanders' access to good food. And on the flip side, and this won't surprise you, the majority of New Zealanders are really concerned about the cost of food and their access back to it. Um, recently, just today, I saw an article in the New Zealand Herald about a young family that had um, left New Zealand to go and live in Australia. And one of the key um, points the mother of this family wanted to make was that she's so relieved and excited to have access to healthy food again because she just couldn't afford that in New Zealand. Um, so, yeah, I guess I just don't see that this system as we currently have it is working for everyone and or anyone. And I think um, the fact that there are now 600,000 New Zealanders that needed to access food charity in the last month, and to put that into context, that's the entire population of uh, Canterbury, should tell us that it's time for a reset. And I think anybody that disagrees with that situation really needs to consider what kind of society they'd like to live in um, as we move into the future. There is no um, way I'm going to suggest that we need to stop um, 
some of our food systems, particularly in terms of exporting our food, it's an important way that we um, that we find uh, income um, for our country. But I also don't think it's an either and conversation. I think it can be a both. So while we continue to export food to um, have income, we can also design alongside it local food systems that deliver to New Zealanders. And giving oxygen space and resource to that space um, gives us the opportunity to imagine a different food system moving forwards. So yeah, without touching on everybody, I think that's a really good start. Fantastic, thank you, Angela. When you when you say design a local food system that that delivers, in your mind, what what does that look like? Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is something that we've been working on as a um, organization. It came as a result of um, some research we did with our land and water rural professional fund. And basically it looked at um, some incredible farmers and fishers who were disrupting um, the uh, supply chain um, and really concentrated on how they were um, imagining how things could be different. And so it, it was really the food producers and the design of a food system around them um, that created the thinking in this space. So we looked at regional on-farm milling, um, micro and mobile abattoirs, uh, community fishing hubs, on-farm pasteurization, and the concept of peri-urban and urban farms. And what it does is it understands the New Zealand food systems that currently exist and that we have these different categories of food. So we have food that needs highly regulated, um, is highly regulated and has lots of processing. Uh, and then we have cate another category which has less processing. And then importantly, we think for Aotearoa is the ability to express what makes us culturally unique. And our um, our sort of journey around this has really set around this understanding of um, mahiko and mahingakai and wild food. Um, but obviously, indigenous food systems also include all of these other um, categories as well. Um, and really, what we found in the history to this is that almost weekly, there were iterations of um, suggestions for how we better con connect uh, our food producers and our eaters as an example, Supi and is one of those in as our supermarkets. But none of them really addressed the issue, which was the infrastructure of the middle. So how did um the design of that nationally impact the inability to connect both both of these things? So we really broke down this infrastructure of the middle and suggested uh, ways that we thought that this might work better. And then on the other side, on the eater side, we considered some really important igniters for local food systems. And they include things like um, local procurement systems. And there are examples of this globally, including this um, food in schools program. Um, also this idea that there could be vouchers with incentives for families like the one that left, left um, live in Australia, um, that gave them better access to local fresh food. And then the third one that we think there's huge potential and opportunity around sits around green prescriptions. Interestingly, New Zealand is cited globally as leaders in, food, in green prescriptions, but that really sits around activity and not access to fresh food. So we felt that it was a global opportunity for New Zealand to step into that space. And so designed together, we're putting this forward for consideration. It's not prescriptive. We totally understand that there are many communities in New Zealand who would see this differently, but we're offering it as a conversation starter. That's fantastic. That's a really great, um, Angela, can we put this on our blog later when we have this video so we can show people um, the good work that you've put together here? Absolutely. Yep. I'll Thank stop you. sharing now for the meantime. Thank you. So Emily, one of my questions is we're we're kind of in a mess. Um we've we've set the stage that there's a lot going on. Um what 
what role do you think the government has in helping us uh, transform the food system? We we we've been sort of set in our ways globally. We know that there's been a lot of environmental damage that has been done, obviously, to climate. There's a lot of carbon and methane and a lot of greenhouse gases that are produced because of the food system. If we're looking at moving forward and getting out of the situation that we're in to improve things, what role does do you think the government has in helping us to achieve that? Thanks, Tiff. Great question. Um, there are many, if you're talking about central government, there are many potential ways. So first, let's just acknowledge that it's relatively new for anybody to be thinking about the food system as a food system in the conversations that we have, okay? So a lot of people don't think about the interconnections um, of the system. And where that plays out is different departments within governments, but also within universities or even within businesses, um, where we don't have people talking to each other about what they're doing. So health, for example, agriculture, fisheries, um, you know, yeah, education, um, climate change, you know, all of these things, many, many departments um, within governments touch on the food system. And the challenge is it's an enormous beast, as I refer to it in ReFood. And it, it therefore means that it's largely in the too hard basket um, to think about it from this perspective. And so one of the first things that the government could do is to really first acknowledge that we have a food system and acknowledge that the impacts of it are played out not only in how we grow and make food, but right through to accessing food. And of course, all the parts that Angela's just so awesomely described there about the middle local parts of that system. Um, so removing the silos, acknowledging it, then, yes, Matt Morris, Ministry of Food, we've talked about this for a long time, and Angela and other organisations have put forward the petition for a national food strategy um, as one way of provoking the conversation there within governments to get them thinking about, about this. Um, the other thing I would say is that the elephant in the room with the food system is that it's a private food system with large private companies that have been largely left unfettered globally for about six or seven decades to do what they like with pushing their marketing and their highly processed, highly sugared, unregulated foods onto people to make a lot of money. Um, and that means that it is a really big um, lobby, for want of a better word, that that is in governments and organizations keeping the status quo. So I think we have had in the last year or two a few indications of um, waking up around some of these topics. I'm waiting to see more. But, um, we've had things like the Commerce Commission come in with an inquiry into the supermarkets and the appointment of a groceries commissioner. Um, we've had the incoming government mention its um, potential to step in more in that space around regulations with, with the supermarkets, which, you know, could see some changes there. Um, and also we've, um, we have had indications, could you please mute, thanks. <laughs> um, we've had indications from also, um, yes, we've had indications from a higher level, like the UN and larger international organizations and commitments that the government has to face um, that they need to think about the food system. Some of you would have joined me a couple of years ago in the UN Food System Summit Dialogues, um, which we haven't seen really go anywhere from our New Zealand government. So I would just call for you know, an acknowledgement of the food system, more cohesion within the government departments that are siloed out, um, a bolder stance around protecting the interests, because really, you know, these are very important issues, our farmers and growers, our food businesses, our exports, and our people getting food, you have to question what's more important really than those, those topics. So there's a massive role there, but there's also a massive role for every single one of you on this call and all of us to think about where we sit in the food system and how we can do things better. Um, because there is so much that can be done. And I think if we all sat around waiting for the government to do everything, we'd still be sitting around. And so we've really got, um, yeah, we've really got a lot of momentum at the moment on this topic. So I think we should um, keep pushing. Awesome. Thank you. And Angela, can you quickly just tell us, Eat New Zealand, um, you, you've had a petition for a national food strategy. Can you tell us a little bit about that work? 
Yeah, definitely. So we, um, I just want to acknowledge everyone uh, who supported uh, that call for a um, national food strategy. Basically, the thinking is, is as um, Emily alluded to, we really don't have a compass, a north compass. I want to say a north star, but we're in the southern hemisphere. But we don't have a place that we're all collectively heading towards currently. And that's why we have this adverse situation where one part of our food system really leads us to a place that has unfortunate consequences for everybody. So how do we pull ourselves together as community, as industry and government and decide where we're heading to um, and what could come out of that in terms of an implementable plan after we've decided collectively where we're heading? Um, so that's really what we want to see. I saw the question also about a ministry of food and I agree uh, with someone else, which was basically the idea that we really do have a lot of bodies and a lot of agencies in this space. Um, but we think there needs to be some independence potentially as well, something like a commissioner for food. We have a commissioner for grocery, which I find quite strange and a real indictment of where our food system's at, that we have a, a grocery commissioner, but not a food commissioner. Um, and so I think the opportunity really is for everybody to have a seat at the table and to understand uh, where we want to head in this space. So the strategy at the moment sits with the new, uh, the petition at the moment sits with the new government, with the petitions committee, and we wait to see whether they choose to pick that up off the table um, and take it forward. Great, thanks for that update. So let's dive into one of the key topics that I know um, I've been getting some questions coming in about um, previous to, to today as well. Um, the price of food is astronomical. You know, we're, Emily, in your book, I think you say, you know, we're like the sixth most expensive nation in the world for, for our food pricing. And Angela, you just talked about, and I read the same article of a couple that moved um, from New Zealand over to Brisbane and are so excited about they've never eaten so healthy and they have such great access to food that they can afford. And in terms of our organic producers who are, you know, working really hard for the common good of New Zealand to produce foods in ways that are um, ecologically, you know, and environmentally better and, and healthier and safer for our communities, are having a really tough time getting our products from from farm and 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 orchard and and from our growers to to consumers and the current food system doesn't really allow much space and i know you showed us angela a little bit on the um the infographic but let's i'd like to talk a little bit about about what are the opportunities to help growers get their food to consumers um, and what we can do to help break the, the, the channels down so that the existing barriers are reduced so we can get better food, um, high quality, locally grown food to, to consumers. Um, Emily, would you like to start and then Angela? Yeah, thanks, Tiff. I'll have a go. Um, so when I spoke at the start setting the scene, I spoke about the global zeitgeist, and I think we have to actually remember that as well, because these factors do affect us. We are a small island at the bottom of the world, quite far away from things. We're also staunchly independent, so we cut our subsidies in the 80s and proudly did that with our farmers um, at the time bearing the brunt of it and now holding on to that position. So we have um, quite a different start point from large countries with a higher population and those who are cushioned um, somewhat by subsidies in countries within the EU and also um, Canada and the US and the like who apply those things. Um, and yeah, so we can't ignore factors like that, factors like geography, low population and distance um, from, from areas. So this sets our scene. That doesn't mean that we can't make changes to make it um, better for our growers and farmers, particularly our organic growers and farmers um, who are here today that obviously face even more um, regulation around certifications um, and costs that that takes and time um, and, and other things. And so I think that 
a real assessment of what that looks like is worth discussing. Um, as a sort of, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of ways to rethink the food system um, and I go into these in ReFood, but one of the things I did talk about is just bearing in mind the true cost of food, um, which I'm, you know, preaching, <laughs> no, not preaching, I'm speaking to a well-informed audience on this topic as growers of organic food, that true cost is is never accounted for in the large-scale conventional food system um, that we've been talking about today. And so, of course, it is cheaper to make um, relatively highly processed um, ingredients um, and ship them at a large scale around the world um, than it is to grow um, really good food at, at a local level. And so, yeah, there's lots of lots of reasons in the background against this, but I don't think that that should stop us trying to come up with innovative ways and applauding Eat New Zealand and others who are looking at some of these um, local systems that might serve New Zealand slightly better around some of these topics and also support for our growers. Um, not only organic, but others who are, you know, facing high regulations, um, high labour costs, really challenged to find good labour workers within the country um, and reliant on overseas imported labour um, to, to grow our food. So there's, there's a lot that it takes. There's a lot of cost that goes into it and a lot of factors that play into why New Zealand um, is so much more expensive. Um, and of course, also those big global three war, climate change, and the, the rising prices of food as a result. Thank you. Uh, Angela, do you have some thoughts? Uh, yeah, just um, would support the comments that Emily made there um, and just encourage people to realise that plugging into a broken system and expecting a great outcome is probably an exercise in futility and to be even slightly harsher you know the definition of stupidity is to um, continue to do the same thing again and again and expect a different result so really to take the time to pause and zone and zoom out as um, Emily suggested to have a food systems approach to this um, and to imagine something different and to be brave in that imagination. You know, that's we are a small country on the edge of the known universe and we do have some incredibly difficult, even within New Zealand, we're a long skinny country with a strait of water between us. So transport and logistics is incredibly difficult. We have a lot um, a lot of barriers, but the opportunity of being a country of 5 million people who uh, have shown historically the ability for just pathological co collaboration um, suggests that we also have the ability to pull ourselves together and imagine something other that in turn could lead the world around food systems. So that's what gives me hope and gets me up every morning is that we are well capable um, because of our, um, our traits and who we are as people to imagine something different and, and also an opportunity to consider our indigenous food systems and how they might inform how we move forward and what have we lost by colonization and what is the opportunity to go back and, and, and listen and understand what those systems were and whether they could inform and help us moving forwards. Absolutely. Well said, Angela. And thank you, Emily, too. I watched a video about Organic Little Farm um, that was having a hard time. They make amazing boxes filled with, uh, with organic food grown, you know, locally outside of Wellington. They have veggie boxes that are available. There's 200,000 people in their region and they're having a hard time selling 200 boxes. People have a lot of habitual um, methods of shopping. Uh, there's this sort of beeline to the grocery store for anything and everything. But if we want to change, there's a lot of producers out there that we can support in other ways. There's a lot of great farmers markets. There's a lot of great veggie boxes. There's a lot of great independent stores um, and as well as the supermarkets that have some organic products. But, the it, you know, there's a lot of independent um, growers that we can support by changing the ways that we shop. Um, what are some of the other other ways that you can think of in, in terms of helping support some of those small producers? 
how do we how do we support them in our local communities? Um, Emily, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the strength of our country is that we are, are connected and that we can grow good food in various locations and do have a lot of available land to do so. And for those people that, you know, are, yeah, I guess I'll just retract that. So, there are um, there are many organisations growing good food locally in communities, and we saw this pop up out of COVID actually, um, especially looking at community based food initiatives, um, marae growing amazing marakai um, across the whole country in response to being able to feed communities. We have a lot of potential there, and we do have those resources if people are, and they don't have to be expensive either. So. Um, I think they sometimes are, but they don't have to be. And so I think that the more we can support and encourage the growth of those community-based initiatives, uh, the better. And the more we can support organizations who are trying really hard to do this. I see Jill from Ubi on the line, um, long-standing people trying to connect consumers to growers through online platforms and digital ways. So there are lots of different things. Um, I live in a community that really struggles with the ability to grow food for ourselves. Um, and we have a lot of community initiatives and we have a lot of people want to, but I also agree with you, Tiff, that sometimes um, changing the habits and changing the way people think. I run a crop swap. I've run it for six years. I have 385 people on the Facebook group and every single week it's the same eight people that come to crop swap. Now that might be speaking to other factors as well, but just to give you an idea of the, like people like the ideas of these things, we see this come up in consumer research as well. People like the ideas of um, growing organics or eating healthier food, but when it comes to actually changing habits and doing it, so we need to come at it from lots of different perspectives. Um, also, I spoke earlier about the challenges we face with the food environments being framed up and um, supported by large food and big businesses that um, have large marketing budgets and have big bricks and mortar stores. So we have to also think about how we're including our community-based food initiatives and our ability to grow food in our urban planning and design, particularly if we're putting in things like housing developments over primary um, land that's highly productive, as we see in many of our large cities at the moment. So how can we actually incorporate and design systems that really include local and regional food and support those growers is really integral into coming up with these solutions. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to shift. We're going to be in the same system that we've been in for many a year with, you know, just a speckling of a few producers trying to grow food. Um, so we really, we really need to make sure that we're breaking down some of these barriers that are prohibiting it. Um, even within um, councils and authorities, there's challenges there. I spoke to people within a council recently who are really struggling with, even within their organization, um, to get available land for people to grow food from um, and to make that av available. So we have to really think about how we're regulating these things. And if we had the food system at the fore of our mind when we were creating things like our district plans and our regional policy statements, not just abstract things or breaking it down into silos like soil, water, and other things. If we actually had the food system in mind when we were doing that, then we could design our spaces and our cities and our islands and our areas in a way that actually really enabled the production of food and supported our growers to be able to grow it. Because right now, it is not like that at all. It's not designed that way. You know, and as I say in my book, if you're an onion farmer and you've got a developer about to pay you $3 million for your, your patch of land um, to put up a house, then what are you going to do? So let's let's be realistic about um, the things that are going on in the background forcing the situation. Absolutely. And you touched on the, um, the urban uh, conundrum around utilizing really high quality land um, for growing food versus high quality land going for growing housing. I know that's a big debate that's been going on around um, our urban centers. And we've seen a lot of uh, a big influence um, from organizations like For the Love of Bees that have been tackling um, urban gardening and doing fantastic work and, and helping to um, push the, the urban landscape towards 
more sustainable um, food systems even in our urban spaces, which is really fantastic. It's awesome to see to see that work going on. But we need to make sure that we're actually creating policy and regulations that are enabling that because you know we can't just have one flagship great story in each city um, yeah. to think that we're actually feeding 1.5 million people from it. Like it's completely unrealistic. So you know we really need to actually think about this in a more comprehensive way at a municipality level. For that yeah, too. and yeah, yeah, I agree with that completely, Emily. In the eight years that we've been in. Um, considering this, I have seen the most ridiculous pittance of support in terms of government resource in this space. I, we already have the solutions in every community, but they are they are run by volunteers who um, are expected to solve these national problems in their spare time. Um, and I've seen, you know, Putia that's just. Uh, just so minuscule to um, address that from a single agency um, we just don't see a comprehensive strategy to support local food systems whatsoever um, and an incredible amount of money that goes into um, the other side of our food system so you know, speaking directly to the government agencies that are listening to this, we know that there's an opportunity where you've brought yourselves together as a cross-agency group to consider the New Zealand food system. So I just ask you to consider resourcing local food systems and the incredible people who are already doing the mahi and finding solutions for their communities. Um, it already exists. You don't need to create it, um, but supporting it would transform New Zealand, I'm really convinced. Fantastic. Thank you. We've got a question here to both you, um, Emily and Angela. And the question is, in an increasingly energy, carbon and materials constrained world, do you see the possibility of a growth in bioregionalism or rollback of globalization in multi-continent supply chains with an increase in product diversification to enhance food security? It's from Alistair Shorn, if you want to read that one in your chat. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're talking about is relocalism, and um, I think that's definitely going to be part of our future and an important part of our um, future food security for New Zealand. We can already see regional councils, local councils or TAs step into the space of considering regional food security. And if there are people who are listening to this, who sit in that regional space, um, I need to let you know that we have great hope <laughs> in you all that you will be the uh, solution to some of these issues, uh, that potentially central government doesn't have such a connection to community to understand what that might look like specifically for your regional communities. I think, um, but again, there has to be framing and support and resource for that to happen. And Emily, did you have any comments on that question as well? No? So Francis, I'm reading your, um, the last New Zealand adult nutrition survey was dated from 2008-2009. And the last child nutrition survey was prior to this. So only now, 14 years later, new nutrition survey is being designed. Obviously, dots are unjoined, read the nutrition and spiraling healthcare costs. Do you, Emily, do you want to speak to um, to that survey and lack of uh, understanding nutrition? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Francis, for raising it. Um, yes, we have a dearth of data. Um, it's not only in nutrition, I might add. It's across many of our different aspects that affect the food system. Um, yeah, and disappointing that um, this wasn't picked up nor addressed by our previous or outgoing government, um, which would have been in a good position to do that, um, not really sure why. So we can't rely on data that's um, 15 years old um, to talk about what's really happening in our country. And I think most of us are sick of, it, of doing that. So pushing for um, yeah, updated surveys, but more data across many aspects, data in food waste, which is lacking, data um, around um, land use, which 
um, is present in some aspects, but doesn't include everything. Um, so I think that, you know, it's very convenient not to be able to tell a strong story if um, you don't have the information. So I would rather see the information and have people work out what they can do to solve it. Um, although I must do a little um, Mahi to Stats NZ who do do a great job of what data they do have um, and how to share it. So obviously I researched and wrote my book um, and I was looking for updated data across the full food system and really struggled on many um, aspects to pull up to date um, and recent data. So I know firsthand how struggling how it is um, a struggle to communicate and create change if you don't have information that's readily available. So I share that concern, Francis. Great, thank you. And Angela, um, Stefan has asked about, um, you know, that we see Denmark has really effective government, um, they call green procurement for organic food. Um, and excess and it increases it increases the uh, demand for, you know so that they can increase supply and and get the wheels turning and you briefly touched on procurement policies for local food systems uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about what you foresee some of the procurement um, the benefits of procurement that are going to happen if the government opens that door yeah, it's not just um, parts of Scandinavia, but also parts of uh, other parts of Europe, inc including France, that have really um, considered how the food is grown that is used um, in government procurement systems. So I think there's huge opportunity uh, for New Zealand to front foot that and to learn from those other countries. Um, but that means that we have to step into that procurement space. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the simplest solutions and a really great place to start right now in terms of supporting New Zealand um, small to medium food producers. Um, so yes, I agree. Globally, we can use those examples and apply them to New Zealand. I'll just add that we have the procurement frameworks there. Um, the requirements within our procurement frameworks are around sustainability. Um, but they could go a step further if they were to take a food systems approach and actually acknowledge our farmers and growers. Um, and then they could go even further, as you've suggested, Stefan, and actually have references to foods like organics um, listed in there. The other thing that Denmark's done pretty well is its work on pesticides and the cap there for farmers on um, the amounts and then giving actually a tax taxing it um, at the sale point um, when you're when you're purchasing, but then actually that fund going back into support farmers. So um, there are really novel um, economic models that we can apply across many of these things to get a better reflection of the true cost of food, um, not only through procurement, but through other innovative ways. We just need to be a little gutsier. And while we're on the Denmark love train, can I also put a shout out to um, the importance of being able to celebrate and um, to talk strongly to our food culture and who we are. And Denmark uh, is a great example of that, actually valuing their national food story and what the flow and effects from that is because pe the people in Denmark see themselves as a food nation. And I'm sure there's people from Denmark that would disagree with all of that. But from afar, um, you know, it's been a government led initiative that's really understood the value of raising the awareness about food culture and who they are as food people. So, you know, that's a huge opportunity for New Zealand as well, I believe. Yes, we could really celebrate better. Um, and we could do that, you know, if there are retailers in there, it's some stores do a good job of showing where the food's from. Um, we're also now regulated slightly on that. But, you know, you could go a step further and really talk about and celebrate in a, a more obvious way for people, um, those growers and farmers who are from and makers who are from New Zealand. So, yeah, I really think we could do a lot better there. I agree. And I really love the work that Eat New Zealand did with Feast Matariki um, and bringing um, Matariki and, and the celebration and the culinary experience of that celebration um, to light is, was just fantastic. So kudos to, um, to bringing that to all of us to help celebrate. Yeah, it comes back to our original purpose, which was ensuring 
um, that people have access to our food story, but also to our ingredients to be able to celebrate with them. Because it's one thing to say to the rest of the world that we are a wonderful place to get food from to our global customers, but it's another thing to then have those global customers come here and not be able to find the food. So how do we re um, how do we talk about that um, imbalance and how do we rebalance that to ensure that everybody from uh, people who do, who don't have enough food in general to our chefs who don't have access to some of those ingredients that are being sent elsewhere. So again, it's this overall access to food conversation I think is super important. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we'll end on one more question from Charles Murfield from Murph. It says, uh, what do you see organics at a national and international level to address food system issues as it has mostly been focused on at on-farm issues with some focus on retail level, particularly within standards and certification? Contrast that with version three agroecology, which strongly encompasses the whole food system including social and political aspects of the food system, both the input and the retail side. Yeah, I can speak to it. I mean, it's it's a valid point. And I, as you've heard today, always advocate for the full food system approach. And so um, a sector like organics could really benefit from actually taking that approach um, and understanding it deeply and thinking about the system. Um, while you'll be thinking about certain other systems, um, particularly within growing practices and the like, um, fully understanding that lens I've seen bring great benefit to communities and people and topics like access to food and also affordability. So um, I think everybody can um, do better and everybody can look inwards and see how um, how a framework like a food systems approach or other things can be applied to to what they do um, and also of course um, noting that the system is always it's never solved and it never goes away but it's always evolving and so staying abreast with the new things that are coming in and how that can compare and contrast to what you're already doing which I as an observer think OANS actually does quite well on um, obviously that's one part of a bigger um, organic sector but yeah I think that um, constantly checking in and reassessing and seeing how it measures up is a really important practice for all of for everybody in whatever business you're running and however you're connected. Yeah, I think from my, um, I would add to that and perhaps a way to end from me on a bit of hope, one of, an, an example of a place where technology can really um, contribute this idea that we'll be able to measure the nutrient density of our food in, in real time um, from personal devices that will be able to tell us uh, whether that food is um, going to be good for us and how good it's going to be. And this technology exists and it's being developed at speed. And I think that's the opportunity for organics um, because there is, you know, there is no, um, there's no way around that. And so instead of becoming, uh, staying in an input focused model, you become outcome focused and I genuinely think that's the the real opportunity for organics um, globally and in New Zealand so to uh, join up all of the understanding and all of the knowledge and experience you have to uh, really show what nutrient dense food is and then to have customers that can find that in real time I think will be absolutely game-changing. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, both of you. It's one o'clock on the dot. Wow, this is great. I want to continue these conversations and have, you know, food system conferences and keep, you know, keep working on uh, on the subject and, and keep checking in and keep evolving and keep trying to um, to make the shifts that we want to see and in in develop the communities that we want to live in. And uh, taking everything that you have both told us today. I think we have some really great insights on how to achieve that. I want to thank you, um, Emily and Angela, for coming on. Thank you all to all of you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We'll have the web um, the webinar online on Owen's website on Monday, and uh, we'll send out an email to make sure that you all know that when it's up. If you have any other burning questions, you can email me at Tiffany at Owens dot org and uh, we'll try to get those questions solved for you 
Thank you so much. I just wanted to end on a whakatauke. Um, No te roro, naku te roro, ka ora te manahere. And with your food basket and my food basket, the visitors will be cared for. I think that we should continue to think of those that don't have food um, today in our communities and in the world and consider how we act in accordance with that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Kia ora, everyone.